and tonight um, we are going to have Sonia Dumpelman and Enrique Ramirez talking with us about um, aerials and um, camouflage and reconnaissance around the World War II era, post-war era, um, in both its concrete and its theoretical terms. Um, Sonia joins us from Harvard, where she's an associate professor of landscape, um, and she has a forthcoming book on the aerial in landscape architecture. Um, there are order forms in the back, it should be out soon. Um, and Enrique uh, joins us from Princeton where he is finishing up some work. He recently completed a dissertation um, on the aerial image in 18th and 19th century France. So without further ado, I'm gonna let Sonia start. Thank you. Thanks, Meg, um, for the invitation and organizing this beautiful show, first of all. I think I have to get organized. <laughs> Because what I'm going to do, um, I did prepare a more or less formal presentation, so kind of bear with me. But if you have questions in between, we're kind of a small group, so I think you know, just shout out loud or ra raise your hand or anything. Um, and so, basically, what I want to do in this short presentation is um, deal with various ways that designers camouflaged camouflage during, the, during and after sec the Second World War. And so what I'll be talking about um, is what I will call uh, picturesque camouflage and um, authentic camouflage and copied cam camouflage. So I'll show how camouflage during World War II was seen by many design professionals as a type of landscape design which I'm calling picturesque camouflage. So the principles of imitation and deception were indeed integral to both picturesque landscape gardens, as I will show you, and camouflage. And then talking about authentic camouflage, I will present to you how camouflage measures literally doubled as landscape design, um, an attempt to make camouflage as authentic as possible. And then with copied camouflage, I'll show how camouflage principles that were developed or further developed in wartime were used in peacetime as well. So um, let's start with picturesque camouflage. So in September 1944, one year before the end of World War II, the British architect and camouflage officer Hugh Casson humorously suggested that camouflage could remind the landscape gardener of, as he said, Price and Sir William Temple's Sharavaji. So I'll come back to that. Kasson's uh, reference to the two 18th century British writers and to Sharavaji, a term used by Temple to describe the natural appearance of artfully designed gardens in China, illustrates that design professionals saw a parallel between the methods used in 18th and 19th century picturesque garden landscapes promoted by um, writers like Yuvdale Price and William Temple, and 20th century camouflage work. In fact, imitation and deception, methods used in 18th and 19th century landscape gardens, were key in camouflage designs. So some of you may be familiar with um, images like these, or these particular images. Um, these are images by um, watercolor sketches, drawings by uh, the landscape, the late 18th century, early 19th century landscape gardener Humphrey Repton, um, a British landscape gardener who produced the so-called Red Books, um, which were uh, books um, with watercolor sketches that showed before and after scenes of the estate grounds, the landscape gardens that he essentially designed. Um, so for each of his clients, he was a very, um, a good businessman. He produced um, a book clad in red leather, hence the name Red Book, and um, uh, basically sketched the existing um, condition, which you see on top here for one of the sites that he was supposed to be improving, as they like to say in that period. And then the after image, so this is what it was going to become, and there's actually, if you look very closely, you can see these paper flaps, so there's actually a paper flap on top here that you fold back, 
and then you see the after image. So that in and of itself obviously is an interesting um, technique uh, that was developed at the time and then actually we're still seeing it um, just a couple of years ago. I'm kind of, you know, venturing into other directions right now. I'll be back on camouflage in a second. But um, since we're in New York City, uh, the High Line just some years ago had this interesting uh, billboard showing uh, a huge photograph of what it looked um, like before it was turned into this linear parkway or park. And so juxtaposing the before and the after is a very common thing actually in landscape architecture and landscape design. Um, so while it's clear that the ideology underlying 18th century picturesque landscape gardens was different from that of 20th century camouflage schemes, the aesthetic intent was the same. Artificial landscapes were to look as natural as possible. In their imitation of nature and human settlements, they were to deceive the viewer. The 20th century landscapes of war had to appear natural, not only from the horizontal perspective, but from the vertical perspective as well. With the use of powered aviation during World War I, vertical camouflage had become a necessity. During World War II, concealment from the aerial view became not only more sophisticated, um, but given the time-space compression that occurred as a result of powered flight, camouflage also had to be practiced on much larger scales than ever before. Um, so there are actually um, a number of people in the field at the time who talk about um, camouflage as a type of regional planning. Um, the design of war landscapes using diverse means of concealment therefore um, became an important and integral part of tactical and strategic military planning. If enemy bombers were to be disoriented and deceived, entire regions obviously had to be studied. Camouflage needed to be carried out in different environments characterized by different land use patterns in cities as well as in rural areas. And camouflage included site selection and the unobtrusive integration of buildings into the respective environment, the preservation of plant materials, new tree and shrub planting, the choice of form, color, and texture, and the use of artificial camouflage like netting, smoke, and decoys. Landscape architects, and I'll be concentrating actually in this talk, especially on the, on the work of landscape architects and urban designers in the realm of camouflage. So landscape architects were trained in many of these activities, and they were trained in using natural materials, creating a new nature. It comes as no surprise that many landscape architects were therefore involved in camouflage work. In the United States, some landscape architects argued that both camouflage and landscape architecture dealt, in quote, in large measure with the creation of environment and the organization of land space, as landscape architect Armistead Fitzhugh noted. Both jobs, he observed, require a balanced artistic and scientific approach. Indeed, by World War II, camouflage was considered both an art and a science. And it was, to tie this into the title of Max's show, an aerial or an anti-aerial art, we may say. Camouflage was an attractive job to landscape architects and other design professionals because it not only relied on their skills, but it also protected them from serving at the front. Only few designers publicly admitted the ethical dilemma that they found themselves in. Should they be using their skills and masking elements of the landscape in warfare and to deceive. It was obvious that practices used by landscape designers since the, since the 18th century came in handy in camouflage work. The translation of garden and landscape design principles, um, for example, becomes apparent in this thumbnail illustration, or in these thumbnail illustrations I'm showing you here, um, of a suggested camouflage planting scheme um, that was published in a military handbook um, down here, so this was published in the 1940s, and up here, this is a publication of um, pathways and the ways of planting trees along those pathways in the early 19th century from a publication by the uh, landscape garden of John Claudius Loudon, so again, a British figure in this case. And so, you know, in this case, it's just uh, quite <laughs> very um, interesting to see even the uh, uh, similarity in, in terms of drawing that was 
kind of used uh, or sketching out. And in this case, um, so you see in this military handbook, this was an unsatisfactory uh, way of camouflaging a building that we see here, uh, the rooftop. And then basically the suggested way of camouflaging it was what was um, illustrated here on the right. And on the left and on the right here, John Claudius Loudon in the early 19th, uh, 18th, 19th century um, is uh, juxtaposing what he called the so-called gardenesque way of planting trees on the left, where you see it's basically that each individual tree is standing on its own and has a lot of space to develop freely um, versus the so-called picturesque way of planting trees. And of course, which we're seeing this in plan view. Um, so uh, the translation of garden and landscape design principles really becomes um, quite apparent here. And um, camouflage plans that were drawn up looked like this. Um, and I'm one here that was drawn up for uh, Bradley Field near Hartford, Connecticut, which is now the, Hart the, the international airport in Hartford. Um, so with the help of a variety of techniques, including chemical treatment of grass and burnt brush piles, the military tried to simulate orchards, hedgerows, and cultivated fields. Um, and if you look closely, then you can make out the runways. So uh, these were the runways, but they were camouflaged through uh, different types of methods, giving uh, the surface um, or making it appear as if it was just um, crops and hedgerows that extended over the runways. So um, at another location in Louisiana, just to show you um, some more images here, um, at Barksdale Field, um, the effort was camouflaged by means of dummy ditches, orchards, and, and roads. And kind of these are some camouflage activities that are then um, tested also through then obviously taking the aerial photography to see what it actually looks like from, from the air. Uh, more or less successful in this case, obviously. Um, so let's go and uh, move on to uh, this, this topic, so the authentic camouflage. So for picturesque camouflage to be successful, and in the best case scenario, be camouflaged itself, it needed to be authentic. That means it needed to be a real environment as opposed to merely a stage set. It needed to be more than a temporary and superficial skin, as in the case um, of this uh, plan for a decoy landscape on top of a British supply camp. In addition to promoting the decentralization and dispersal of industrial buildings, they were to be designed and positioned so as to appear as part of the landscape. For this purpose, the warfaring nations soon made use of so-called living camouflage. Not only did they integrate in their camouflage netting cut plant materials and branches, as well as Spanish moss in the US and Caluna vulgaris or small conifers in Europe. Showing you some examples here. So this is an example from uh, Berlin, uh, where obviously in winter time uh, at Christmas, uh, they probably thought that the Christmas trees were particularly um, appropriate here. Um, and so, but not only did they use this uh, type of vegetation, but on the home front, so in the US, they also developed schemes that used la uh, so-called living vegetation on much larger scales. So in contrast to fake trees, like the different variety, uh, sorry, this is an, another example actually from Hamburg in this case, so covering an entire um, lake uh, in the city with fake roads, I'll come back to that again, and also, as you can see here, um, in part fake, but also in part um, trees that were cut and then brought to this location. Um, so in, in contrast to um, the fake trees that you see here, which was another means of camouflaging, uh, the different varieties um, of living camouflage consisted mainly of shru uh, shrubs and trees. And especially in the, the case of large areas, real tree plantings were very practical, of course. In contrast to artificial materials, trees and shrubs that were adapted to the respective site were more permanent despite the ephemeral qualities in the case of deciduous species. 
They changed with the seasons and therefore quite naturally had a chameleonic effect. Given that the physicist Matthew Lukish had pointed out already in the 1920s that chlorophyll and uh, green color pigments show different reactions to infrared and ultraviolet bands of light, living camouflage could also prevent its detection on infrared film that was developed during World War II for this purpose. So living camouflage was used to shield large parking areas near industry from view and to distort and blur the form and shadow of buildings. It was found that roofs could also be planted with live grass and shrubs and that the grading of adjacent terrain at an angle of 10 degrees could eliminate building shadows. Um, and another interesting or quite intriguing um, example of wartime uh, inventions are the so-called Watson's pots, uh, concrete bricks with holes for grass plantings that were invented by the British horticulturalist Leslie Watson um, and meant to provide naturally camouflaged yet heavy-duty aircraft landing areas that drained easily and did not dust. So Watson's pots seem likely to have been a precedent for today's permeable pavers often used for parking lots. In Germany, landscape architects worked for the Nazi program uh, or Nazi programs like um, Schönheit der Arbeit, uh, meaning the beauty of work, and Kraft durch Freude, so uh, power through um, elevation through fun <laughs> or um, yeah, gratitude. So pro programs that besides lifting public morale and spirits were intended to camouflage camouflage measures. The landscape architect Hermann Matern, for example, designed the grounds for factories as part of the nationwide program um, Beauty of the Work uh, for the beautification and improvement of workplaces and environments. And this is just a pamphlet um, that actually is in the collection of the British military because, um, because of British intelligence. Um, uh, so, while intended to provide landscape architects and contractors with work, factory workers with healthy, uplifting spaces and uplifting spaces for their work breaks that instilled in them a sense for the nature of their homeland, the greening of industry had an equally, if not more important, side effect, air raid protection. So tree plantings were supposed to hide industrial buildings and blend them into the surrounding countryside both because of their unseemly architecture and because of their vulnerability of, to aerial observation and attack. Inspired by intelligence reports on the German treatment of industrial plants, British military officers also turned to landscape architects and horticulturalists for their expertise in living camouflage. The biggest advantages of live plant material were considered its more convincing uh, nature, its permanency, its improvement and development from camouflage to concealment over time, and its seasonal change, and I'm quoting, rendering the ground patterning entirely in harmony with the surrounding country. Um, so the, the British uh, garden architect James Lieber designed planting plans for so-called living camouflage belts that would be inconspicuous from the air. And following German examples, Lieber aimed at enclosing industrial grounds with forested areas, living camouflage belts that not only camouflaged industry by breaking up shadows, but that also provided the nursery stock for future camouflage measures in other locations. So Lieber based his planting design on the aerial view of a typical English wood, as he said, of long standing that shows up from the air as a blackish brown mass due to the great density of, to coin a word, twiggage. So um, he actually didn't, you know, I always crack myself up at this kind of twig, the, the, um, the twiggage, <laughs> the mentioning of the word twiggage, but I actually didn't coin it because I found it in some um, American tree choices that were published earlier. Um, so, but he re recommended the use of native plants because they had smaller leaves and provided that dense mass of brown or black-brown twiggage that provided better concealment throughout the entire year. The heightened interest in camouflage planting went hand in hand with an increasing awareness in the nursery industry. The American Association of Nursery Men and the camouflage section of the engineer board at Fort, Fort uh, Balvois in Virginia developed a manual that categorized 
and listed available plant materials for camouflage in different Army Corps area of the US. Botanists at Harvard University's Arnold Arboretum conducted research into surface covering water plants to disguise, to, for the disguise of harbors and large water surfaces. And they also worked on the development of a spray that could prevent cut plant materials from wilting and losing color. And that's a technology that the florists, of course, today are very interested in as well, but that actually was only achieved to a certain extent to be very practical in the 1960s when it then basically um, became a product on the market for florists, for example, here in the US. So due to their importance, um, and these images actually show you parts of this um, Harvard uh, research project during the Second World War, um, dealing with cut plant materials, and specifically in this case, actually you know, plant materials that could be used and um, or used in the Asian theater of war. So, due to their importance for air raid protection, shade trees along roadsides were to be protected from insect pests. Various authors therefore argued that insecticides needed to be used on shade trees rather than on food crops. After all, insinuated the journalist Cynthia Westcott, healthy shade trees may, serve, uh, may, may save, save more lives than wormless apples, is what she said. The immediate concern for survival was very strong and concern for the larger environment and the effects that the extensive chemical treatment of plants and wide stretches of land would have only became topics in the post-war years. Thus, different types of fertilizers Sodium arsenate that killed grass tops, ammonium um, thiocyanate that turned grass brown and then white, and iron sulfate and tannic um, acid solutions that turned ground cover black were indiscriminately used on extensive areas to simulate different field patterns and shadows. And um, on the left here, what you see here, this is actually a painted hedge here. I mean, obviously, this is a real shrub, but this whole thing and this kind of little blotch here are painted on the grass. Um, to promote the elaboration of camouflage schemes that appeared as authentic as possible, an aerial imagination was essential. Aerial photography was used both to plan camouflage schemes and to train officers in their detection and attack. Aerial photo mosaics provided the basis for terrain models and for the drawing up of target maps. And we have such beautiful materials that Mag collected and assembled here. Um, and uh, while aerial photography flattened the terrain, or um, sorry, aerial mosaics um, also uh, provided the basis for terrain models uh, that I'm showing you here and for drawing up target maps. And then while aerial photography flattened the terrain, it was also used for the production of three-dimensional relief models um, that in turn were thought to provide bomber pilots with a more authentic, sorry, I don't know why this is um, going for it, um, view of the land in preparation of their missions. So to study views onto the land there were, um, that, that were as realistic as possible, officers, uh, officers could study terrain models through so-called haze boxes that simulated a foggy and uh, hazy atmosphere, and that's what you see here. <laughs> um, so while, uh, while living camouflage had a high chance of appearing as an authentic environment from the air and on the ground, many urban camouflage schemes did not. Uh, fake roads were built to camouflage Berlin's convention center, as you can see here, and a fake road also ran across the nearby Lietzensee Park, and I'm showing you two images here on the left. Um, in addition, the water surface of the lake in this public urban park was covered with wooden planks and fake trees. This is actually a US target map of this area of Berlin, and what you see in dark um, here, in, in black or very dark red, um, are all the, uh, is the infrastructure, the rail lines in, in this case and marshalling yards um, here. The location that you see here on the left is actually um, right here. And so you can see that they um, marked part of it as water, so the blue is water um, surfaces, and part of it um, is, is not visible as, as water, um, it's camouflaged. Um, so 
what happened in this park also has a, another um, uh, interesting story uh, to it because uh, citizens actually complained about the loss of beauty and the restriction of access through obstacles like a dummy road that was built, or obviously kind of when the, when the lake was covered with these wooden planks. Um, in a different uh, German location in the city of Hamburg, um, this, these are two images that are quite frequently shown. Um, they, they were images taken by the uh, Royal Air Force um, showing a camouflage scheme, um, uh, which I hinted at uh, in earlier. Um, so this uh, lake here is entirely covered by wooden planks, as you can see, and then this rail line is actually moved um, to, <laughs> to this location here uh, to disorientate the, the bombers. Um, and in Hamburg, this extensive camouflage scheme, one of the biggest in, in the German cities, uh, for this large interior lake induced the natives to call it um, the Negro village at that time. Um, so it's an interesting, so basically I'm, I'm giving you these little bits of information as well because of course, you know, it's not only kind of the aerial perception, but it's also um, extremely interesting to see what was actually perceived on the ground and how people were commenting on it um, and difficult to get, get information on that. Um, so copied camouflage, but by, before I get to that, so that's actually what, what this Hamburg site um, looked like uh, from a slightly oblique uh, point of view. So dealing with um, copied camouflage now. So a motivation for camouflage research during the war years was the assumption held by many professionals that camouflage would pr prove useful in peacetime as well. Hugh Casson argued in 1944 that camouflage principles could be used in peacetime to cite factories in a way that would make them inconspicuous. Indeed, many methods used for camouflage were copied and employed when the landscapes of war were turned into what the landscape architect Sylvia Crow in Britain called a landscape of power. Um, so a landscape of power characterized by power stations, power lines, transformers, telegraph poles, and wires radio masts and airfields. Although Crow embraced the new shapes caused by transportation and industry, she approached many of her post-war commissions for the British Forestry Commission and the Central Electricity Generating Board in a similar way to that of a camouflage officer. And she'd actually served in the war as well, um, but behind the front um, in, uh, for the Red Cross. So following the 1957 Electricity Act that held the Central Electricity Generating Board, the Electricity Council, and the minister responsible for the preservation of amenities, Crow's agenda was determined by the idea that the buildings and structures of new industries like nuclear power, communication, and transportation needed to be assimilated into the landscape by preserving and redesigning where necessary the entire surface cover of the land into one flowing comprehensive pattern, as she said. Several of her drawings illustrate how power and transformer stations can, could um, unobtrusively be integrated into the existing landscape pattern, demonstrating the principles used in industrial camouflage during World War II. Like the early camouflers and their observers during World War I, who had noted parallels between camouflage work, landscape patterns, and modern abstract art, Crow compared the patterns of the landscape of power with power clay's composition of arrows and interpenetrating lines. The interlocking shapes and lines of abstract art had so far only been translated into garden designs, um, for example, by Thomas Church in California. And Crow aimed at using these patterns of interlocking sheep, as she called them, to transform entire landscapes. And what you see here um, are, um, again, you know, an, a, an existing situation of a field pattern with a transformer station, which is located here, and then her scheme as to how this transformer station uh, should be integrated into, into this field pattern and into the landscape. So besides the pattern from the air, building, uh, building masses and forms also had to blend into the landscape from the ground view. Planting, siting, and excavating could be used to camouflage and screen transformer stations and make them appear as if they sprung from the earth. 
uh, true to the British landscape, Crow promoted the adoption of the 18th century ha-ha um, to blend buildings with the landscape contours. So um, a ha-ha is a dry ditch um, that typically was um, built uh, in British uh, estates to uh, keep animals that were grazing or um, pasturing um, away from the uh, actual house, also to, to basically keep them at a distance, but at the same time make it appear as if they belonged, were, they were an integral component of this pastoral picturesque landscape that was created. Um, so this is, um, she argued, the haha -ha is a useful device when the building requires the appearance of rising cleanly from the open ground with the landscape sweeping up to it without planting or walls. Amongst the camouflage principles Crow embraced in her, Crow embraced in her post war work were the disruption and breaking up of clear edges, forms, and silhouettes of large buildings through plantings and landforms the use of colors that matched buildings to their surroundings, and roads and fences running parallel to contour lines. According to Crow, the organic pattern of the rural surroundings should impose itself on the industrial plant. So Trasvither, which is a, a nuclear power station, um, the fourth nuclear power station of Britain's 1954 or 55 nuclear power uh, program, whose construction was begun in 1955, in Welsh Snowdonia, was one of the sites where Crow strove to achieve a direct union between the main buildings and the surrounding Welsh mountain landscape by carrying, as she said, the wild landscape right up to the structures. Um, so here we see her plan. The pump house uh, was sunk below ground level and uh, the approach road was unlit, uncurved, and laid out along the contours. The substation was sited on low ground and uh, its surface partly sown with dwarf clover to break up the great expanse of hard surface as seen from higher viewpoints. Ground modeling was used to merge the buildings with the surrounding landforms. That means the ground between the turbine house and the substation was modeled so as to appear as a spur of the surrounding hills. And then at the northeastern, um, corner of the substation, tree planted mounds were built to conceal parts of the power station from the road. Views from the approach roads were carefully orchestrated and forest covers on the hillside sides uh, were planned to blend the buildings into the landscape. Another example of the principles put forward by Crow and some of her landscape architecture colleagues was Jeffrey Jellicoe's design for the landscape treatment surrounding the nuclear power station at Albury, located on the River Severn between Gloucester and Bristol that opened in 1967. The power station was positioned on a platform made from dredged soil, and Jellico designed an abstract field of patterns, as you can see here, for the terraces surrounding the station's platform. The field pattern, structured by hedges and cultivated with different crops and orchards, was connected to the historically grown, more intricate and irregular field pattern of the surrounding countryside by a ring of pasture land. Jellico wanted his rectangular field terraces to mediate um, between the small scale irregular field pattern of the environment, of the environs, and the monumental clear shapes and forms of the power station. Where it was hardly possible to conceal a nuclear power station in the flat landscape of, river of a river estuary from the horizontal view, uh, the field pattern and associated colors Jellico used for his design aimed at blending the, the station's structures into the existing landscape pattern, both visually and on an emotional level. As he had remarked in 1945, a functional tree plan designed for wind shelter and shade quote, dust filtration and camouflage of inevitably dirty corners would with its natural development over time create an, and I'm quoting, emotional bridge between the turbines and the cows. So the principles of imitation and deception integral to both picturesque landscape gardens and camouflage made it appear as a light-heartened and playful pursuit rather than a serious activity that was part of a bloody war. Attempts to render camouflage authentic 
through the use of living camouflage materials, camouflage, camouflage in another way. Finally, copying or adopting camouflage practices in peacetime to create the post-war landscapes of power further naturalized and neutralized both nuclear power and the cultural practices by landscape designers to integrate the new industries into the landscape. So I'm gonna leave you with this comment. <laughs> and I guess pass on to Anika. Yeah. You need the laptop? Sorry. I do not want to open, do not want to open Excel. <laughs> it's for a completely different presentation. But, um. okay, you have it up and then you might want to, want to do um, the energy mirroring rather than. Hold on a second. So how do what I do? I mirror. I don't know what that means. Oh yeah. So hold on. There we go. I see. Now what, what you I see mean. is what they Great. see. Great. Yes. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Um. Hi, that's me. Hi. Thank you so much. Uh, that was a great presentation. It's uh, um, hopefully um, it'll spur some kind of like uh, conversation between the two. Uh, while I'm presenting on this like weird topic of like paranoia and fiction, let me just remind you that I, I am a historian. <laughs> so, uh, and uh, I, um, I came to architecture history from an interest in the history of aviation and the history of warfare. So uh, a lot of this, a lot of the, of the materials in, the, in, the, in, the, in, in Sonia's presentation is, is of, of very much of interest to me. Uh, this material is, uh, is kind of related to my research, but it's also part of a new project that I'm working on at the moment. So, um, and I too will begin in the Second World War, and I will also read, but you know, uh, this is kind of like a formal presentation, but it's not a formal presentation, as you will see. So, so my talk is called The Aerial View in an Age of Paranoia. I'm a postdoctoral research associate in case <laughs> You want to know what that means? I'll tell you after the, after, <laughs> after the presentation. So, okay. So, if you were an intelligence officer stationed at RAF Medmenham in Buckinghamshire from 1942 to 1945, you were not your garden variety intelligence officer. You were atypical because you probably had an advanced degree of some kind. You may have studied geography, geology, archeology, span or even art history at Oxford or Cambridge. Perhaps you were a contributor to the Ordnance Survey a few years ago. You may even have been the half Flemish, half English Derek Jules Gaspard Ulrich Niven van der Bolgarde, gifted with better than perfect eyesight and employed courtesy of the Queen's Royal Regiment as an army intelligence officer, 
looking at freshly developed oblique photographs of concrete revetments, bunkers, and gun emplacements only nights before the Allied invasion of Normandy on June 6, 1944. Three years later, he would become none other than Dick Bogard, matinee idol and leading man in early, in early post-war art cinema pinnacles like Lucino Visconti's Death in Venice and Liliana Cavani's The Night Porter. More likely than not, however, you had an ability to synthesize complex layers of information, to see crystalline patterns through an otherwise confusing morass of data. You also had an appreciation of history. Looking at a vertical aerial photograph of the English countryside, you could distinguish between Roman era, Roman era barrows and eel sloughs dug out in the Essex peat, making this land forever immortalized in Thomas Hardy's novels into something not unlike a tr network of trenches in the Eastern Front circa 1916, or per even perhaps the arabesque of dried up canals scarring the Martian surface, known to us thanks to Percival Lowell's, Lowell's refracting telescope. In short, your depth and breadth of knowledge combined with your extra keen vision made you into a special kind of weapon, blunting the Nazi onslaught as ways of Heinkel, Junkers, and Dornier bombers prowled the darkened skies above English cities. Bogard and other photographic interpreters, or PIs, that's Bogard right there, uh, who served as part of the Allied Central Interpretation Unit in Medmenham, were part of one of the most celebrated, yet only recently understood operations of the Second World War. From 1942 until the end of the conflict, officers and technicians of the Allied Central Interpretation Unit collected, developed, and analyzed around 60,000 vertical and oblique aerial photographs a day all taken by Royal and, United, uh, Royal and United States Army Air Force aircraft over Europe. Seated in dark rooms armed with loop magnifiers, terrain maps, and architectural plans, photographic interpreters used an inventory of over five million aerial photographs to help direct major attacks against, for example, the Mone Dam near Dortmund, uh, U-boat bunkers at Saint-Nazaire and other sites along the French coast, as well as the heavy battleship Bismarck anchored in Norwegian waters. As an intelligence gathering effort of an unprecedented scale, the Central Interpretation Unit also made some of the more grimmer discoveries of the war, such as the group of factories later identified as the Auschwitz-Birkenau concentration camp, and the V-1 missile infrastructure in northern France and the V-2 rocket factory assembly and launch complex at Finemunde on the Baltic coast. In short, these and other efforts by the Central Interpretation Unit speak to the power of the aerial view as knowledge of that most paradoxical kind. Seemingly incontrovertible and undeniable, aerial photography is equally reliant on the latest technological advancements, as well as an individual interpreter's personal skill, experience, and judgment. These efforts during the Second World War also validate one of the most important modernist tropes, the aerial view, whether labeled a bird's eye view, view from above, God's eye view, regard sous bonbon, or as, as James C. Scott calls it, legibility from above, these all create a new image of the world, objective yet catered to a specific purpose at hand. Aerial views, of course, are important to histories of architecture and urbanism. They enabled architects to understand cities differently, yet allowed some to construct their own vision of the modern metropolis. Yet my purpose here tonight is not to controvert the influence and power of the aerial view for our understanding of buildings, cities, and landscapes. Instead, I would like to complement and augment our knowledge of this topic through a kind of counter-narrative, literally. One, where the techniques of aerial photography, like the very information they produce, are imperfect, fraught with error, and as I will later suggest, wholly fabricated. In a sense, we already know this. So imagine yourself in the dar, suspended aloft in a balloon, aiming a wet plate camera at the city below, or try to place yourself in the same aircraft cockpit as Lieutenant jo uh, Colonel George Adam Beasley in 1917, snapping a picture of Turkish and German trenches in the desert, and while doing so, oops, taking an accidental photograph uh, of Samara, the first ever of an Islamic site from the air. These all point to the business of aerial photography and aerial views as you know, you're, you're basically subject to the, you know, to the whims of the actual technology that you're using, whether it's like the, the, the you have to wait for the, for the emulsion on the film to, to dry, as in the case of Nadar here, you basically have to dodge anti-aircraft fire and, you know, and basically 
fear for your own life. So to get back to the Allied Central Interpretation Unit, we ask ourselves, how were these photographs taken? Typically, with a Spitfire, a Mosquito, uh, each of these aircraft mounted with a downward-facing camera, or another mounted on the port side, downwards at a 60-degree angle. The aircraft would make one pass above while using the downward-facing uh, camera, and then um, would make two more passes in opposite directions using the side-mounted camera. Now, mind you, this is all done while evading enemy fire and other hazards, and once developed, the sets of photographs um, uh, for each site would be overlapped so that a photographic interpreter could create his or her own three-dimensional image of the site using a stereoscope. Uh, for all their beauty, this is an example of the images that would produce, you know, for all their beauty, uh, these images often told very little and relied on an interpreter's expert judgment and sometimes guesswork to distinguish, say, a V-1 missile's launching rails from a grain hopper in the French countryside. As these examples show, the kind of knowledge to be gleaned from aerial views in aerial photography is not often visible. And it is a photographic interpreter's task to see beyond the layers of visual information to make this judgment call. This is, as Thomas Pynchon would articulate in his 1973 novel, Gravity's Rainbow, the very definition of paranoia. In short, quote, the reflex of seeking other orders beyond the visible. This is about as terse of a summary you can have of this sprawling work, a part meditation on history, a novel whose main plot lines concern, among other things, the search for the mysterious guidance system behind a new variant of the V2 called the Schwarzgerät, black apparatus or black machine or rocket 0000. Yet Pynchon's own view of, of paranoia as the reflex of seeking other orders beyond the visible has special resonance, for it describes the kind of operation involved when seeing things from above. I'll be provocative and suggest to you that it also describes writing, specifically writing fiction. In 2006, Pynchon wrote to the editor of the Daily Telegraph and defended novelist Ian McEwan against claims of plagiarism with the following observation, quote, oddly enough, most of us who write historical fiction do feel some obligation to accuracy. It's that Ruskin business about a capacity responsive to the claims of fact, but unoppressed by them. Unless we were actually there, we must turn to people who were, or to letters, contemporary reporting, the internet, until, with luck, we can begin to make a few things of our own up. And in, in his introduction to The Slow Learner, his collections of short stories from 1984, Pynchon refers to, quote, not the still photograph of Finnish character, but the movie, The Soul in Flux, quote, as his earliest inspirations for writing. With such talk of seeking orders beyond the invisible, of being enamored with things in flux, here's where I lay things down on the table and ask, if aerial photography is to be equated with a kind of fiction writing, then what examples would we look at? Let me suggest to you that from its very beginnings, photography was conceived as a kind of writing. I am thinking specifically of William Henry Fox Talbot, who introduced readers to the calotype process in his 1844 book, the appropriately titled The Pencil of Nature. The calotype process, also known as photogenic drawing, was a technique for capturing images on paper sensitized with silver nitrate and then fixed with potassium iodide. Fox Talbot just explained it as a kind of matter manipulation. Quote, light, where it exists, can exert an action and in certain circumstances does exert one sufficient to cause changes in material bodies. Talbot's description momentarily presents the idea of light propagating through a medium as if the pencil of nature were a kind of electromagnetic phenomenon or an instance of photokinesis. Yet in a sense, aerial views have always been entangled with the act of writing. This is literally so as the first plots of aerial voyages from the late 18th century involved the creation of lines and in turn of narratives. Take, for example, uh, Jean-Baptiste Mounier's plot of the first flight of a hydrogen-filled balloon from 1784. This image shows the balloon path as it ascended from Champ de Mars. For this, the young engineer hired several mathematicians from the École Militaire and placed them at several different vantage points throughout the city, including the Observatory of Paris, the Towers of Notre Dame, and the guardhouse at the Place Louis XIV. Um, armed with telescopes and watches, 
Their task was to quadrangulate the position of the balloon as it traveled in the air. And due to a lack of coordination, poor telescopes, and inclement weather, only three of the observers could sight and mark the balloon's position. The resulting plot was more a geometrical proof than map, a diagram describing the balloon's brief trajectory before it disappeared into an overcast sky. Champ de Mar appears as a rectangle towards the bottom um, third of the plot, bisected laterally by a line originating from the dome of the Ecole Militaire. Another line intersects with the point at the dome 90 degrees to the line cleaving Champ de Mar. These are the main axes from which the observers derived eight different positions in the balloon's travel using a system of meridians drawn through sighted positions. This limited amount of information under only underscores what little is known about the flight to this day. After the balloon took off from Champ de Mar, some 200 meters away from the Dome of the École Militaire, it curved in a northeasterly direction before a north-northwest wind took it toward Ecouin, where it ruptured and fell to earth. Thereafter, villagers carried the remains of the balloon to Gonessa, which, always, which also happens to be the site of the fatal crash of Air France Concorde Flight 4590, which killed 100 passengers and nine crew members on July 25th, 2000. Another example is this map from 1784 detailing the paths of five balloon flights. Um, so this is a map basically which documents the first year of human flight. Um, entitled Carte de Marche de Gorfie de Guerre, Monsieur Charles, it is, an, it is an, an early document narrating the flight of these balloons in time and space. If Moissinier's plot can be considered as close to real time reports of ballooning, then the 1784 map was more of a historical document, comparative in nature, that told the story of the first year of manned flight in graphic terms. Here, um, I'm describing the colors, but this is obviously a black and white image. Um, so um, individual colored lines corresponded to notable balloon flights, and in some cases, demise. Uh, a yellow line for the flight of the hydrogen-filled Charlier uh, red dots for the ascent of the Elsa Rion on 19 September 1783, a thin red line for Pilatre Rosier's ascent on 21 November 1783, a thick blue line for the, Char for the, for the Frère Charles flight from the Toulouse on 1 December 1783, and finally a brown line showing Jean-Pierre Blanchard's flight from Champ de Mar to Bilancourt on 3 March 1784. It's important to note that instead of straight lines, each of these appears as a curve denoting movement in time and space. I also point out how this map uses the word aerography um, for the term aerographique introduces the possibility of a new kind of graphic domain that is coextensive with developments in human flight. Careful audience that you are, you will no doubt be quick to point out that I am not showing aerial views but maps which are representations of a different order than, say, vertical and ob oblique aerial photographs of Second World War sites. Yet maps are an important reference point, especially, when, especially in this business of conflating the aerial view and fiction writing under a single narrative. Take, for instance, the writer William S. Burroughs, who perfected the Dadaist penchant for the cut up at fold in, a method of writing by literally manipulating physical scraps of text to conjure sentences, paragraphs, and even entire novels. Burroughs embraced the cut-up technique only shortly after he dispatched his first and most well-known novel, The Naked Lunch, from 1959, a dense hallucinatory journey through the belly of America via Tangier that ends with an auger's instructions to the reader at channeling from a near future, quote, you can cut into the naked lunch at any intersection point. In reaching this and subsequent intersection points, Burroughs transforms writing into a kind of autobiographical transport whose docket conveys grim spectra spanning everything from an addict's aphorism to a doper's needle. In a typical Jeremiad, written perhaps under an oneric haze of chloral hydrates, Burroughs channels his grandfather, William S. Burroughs I, founder of the American Arithmometer Company, invoking something of a junkie's notion of eternal return when he writes, quote, so listen to old Uncle Bill Burroughs who invented the Burroughs adding machine regulator gimmick 
on the hydraulic jack principle. No matter how you jerk the handle, the result is always the same for given coordinates. Unlike grandfather Burroughs, the first famous for his hard line drawings, etchings, and centers rented, rendered with sharpened styluses under the mirrored arc of a microscope, Burroughs, the novelist, opted for something more expansive. Quote, in my writing, I am acting as a map maker, an explorer of psychic areas, a cosmonaut of inner space, and I see no point in exploring areas that have already been thoroughly surveyed. This mania for maps and map making would continue in The Ticket That Exploded from 1962, a true cut-up novel, a science fiction nightmare where giant crabs roam the landscape at the behest of the nefarious intergalactic enterprise known as the Nova Mob. In this novel, the autobiographical and cartographical collapse into a single line of text, a moment when Burroughs maps his family history into his own fictions. Quote, Word is an array of calculating machines from Florida up to the old North Pole. Image track goes with it. Indeed, Burroughs jettisons linear narratives in favor of something more like a film unspooling to the end only to spool back to the beginning in an Ouroboros-like manner. Yet as critic Mary McCarthy observed in her review of Naked Lunch, Burroughs, quote, has no use for history, which is all ancient history. A moment reminiscent when another doper, the nefarious Vimpa, salesman for the E. Gay Farben Combine in Pynchon's Gravity's Rainbow, divulges to the Red Army operative Vaslav Chicherin that his role is not to interpret history, but rather to, quote, die to help history grow to its predetermined shape. Burroughs levitates into outer space, literally in his novel, and from here, a, quote, planetary perspective reveals another form, one where history is a slot off skin that, quote, shrivels into a mere wrinkling of furrowing of the surface as in an aerial relief map or one of those pieced together aerial photographs known in the trade as mosaics, end quote. The ticket that exploded ends with, the, with this sentence, cut the pre-recordings into air, into thin air, a statement that is not of the air, but all too grounded, a reminder that the authorial act, the committing of words to the page, is really no different than cutting and pasting them on the flat surface of a page. Stories, characters, and fictions may be communicated from hands to paper via the keystroke on the ribbon of a rocket or Antares Hermes rocket, sorry, of Antares or Hermes rocket typewriter, or a microphone that commits the author's words as magnetized particles on a tape, for example. Yet they are heaped in, into a jumble of words, sentences, and paragraphs that have become something recognizable, something readable. What is a novel but a mosaic of words, a pact between author and reader that this stochastic jumble of text, the endless non sequiturs, the breakneck changes in rhythm and pacing, will resemble something like a story one that makes up for a lack of resolution with a relentless direction and energy. Narrative becomes a topographical construct, a bailiwick with its own features, courses, and jurisdictions. It is a world unto itself, in essence captured on the dust jacket to book number 91 of the Traveler's Companion series of Maurice Giordia's Olympia Press, the 1962 first edition of The Ticket That Exploded. Here, an aerial photograph, presumably of a World War I era French countryside, reveals a silvery, hoary ground of convex, concave, and cyclic polygons stitched together randomly. It covers only half of the dust cover with a simulated tear del delimiting the border between image and text, an illusion of cutting up. And underneath, the ticket that exploded appears in red grease pencil with Burroughs' name typeset in all caps. Aerial photography and cut-up writing here become literal equivalents for the first time. A terrain where two modernist tropes, the aerial regard sous plombant and fragmented multi-perspective writing, intersect to create their own terrain. More evidence of this appeared in 1964 when Burroughs published a single-page cut-up called Warning, 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 Warning for the experimental literary magazine My Own Mag. At the very top of the page, an admonition, also typeset in all caps, refers to aerial nuclear bombardment, while at the bottom, sentence fragments as an assemble into an eight by four grid, quote, to be read every which way. Yet the numbered columns point to a contradiction, one where the orthogonal arrangement of meridians and parallels results in something that is not regular, not ordered, but produced and fortuitous. 
This has always been the case with maps and aerial photographs. Avatars for an incontestable way of looking in the world, an ironclad epistemology that is but a kind of highly attenuated, high altitude abstraction succumbing to all the vagaries and caprices of interpretation. Leave it then to Charles Mason and Jeremiah Dixon, astronomer and surveyor respectively, to engage in the original act of writing the landscape. Like their historical namesakes, the titular heroes of Thomas Pynchon's 1997 novel, Mason and Dixon, are entrusted with creating, and more importantly, inscribing the figurative lines of demarcation that would separate Pennsylvania from Maryland and Maryland from Delaware, the, quote, purest of intersections marked so far upon America. It is Pynchon's most linear, in a sense, straightforward narrative. Mason and Dixon charts a different course for the founding of America. Astronomers and surveyors hobnob with familiar figures cast in a comic light, such as a marijuana smoking George Washington who moonlights as a stand-up comic and a mysterious smoke lens Benjamin Franklin crafting his own version of the Dutch East India Company in the Ohio Valley. The art and science of geodesy still takes center stage as Mason and Dixon travel throughout the world to first record the transit of Venus before interacting with shadowy syndicates and martial arts societies on the eve of the American Revolution. In the end, the novel progresses along with the line of demarcation, a fact not lost upon the narratives, weaved often into interlacing coiled strands that in some way or form always seem to concern lines, whether figurative or literal. The act of surveying and casting meridians and parallels begins with taking the readings of stars, a process that is not unlike the writing of narratives. At least this is what, how in one of the novel's manifold inspired moments, Mason describes the process to Dixon as, quote, numbers nocturnally obtained be set side by side and arranged into lines like those of a text manipulated until a message be revealed. Conversations hardly stay, stray away from such conceits as the link between map, landscape, and writing culminates when a fellow surveyor tells Dixon, quote, this new world was ever a secret body of knowledge meant to be studied with the same dedication as the Hebrew Kabbalah would demand. Forms of the land, the flow of water, the occurrence of what us to be called miracles are all text to be attended to, manipulated, read, remembered. But to what extent is the creation of such lines fiction? As recounted by one of the novel's main narrators, the Reverend Wicks Cherry Cook, quote, the line makes itself felt and yet as long as its distance from the postmarked west remains unmeasured, nor is yet recorded as fact, may it remain a shimmer among the few final pages of its life as fiction. The fictions in Mason and Dixon are recursive, layered upon each other, creating a dense narratological web. Here, fact also mixes with fiction as evidenced by the epigrams from which non-existent books appear alongside more familiar names those with an inclination towards Aristarchus or Hipparchus and who have just read the novel and have taken in cameo appearances by novelist Patrick O'Brien as well as a colonial American analog for Popeye and Mr. Spock. You may take some refuge in the following passage from Timothy Tox's fake epic poem, the epically titled Pennsylvaniad, itself another example of Mason and Dixon's geodesical imagination. Let judges judge and lawyers have their day, yet soon or late the line will find its way. For skies grow thick with aviating swine, ere mess pass up the chance to draw the line. Which such, with such talk of aviating swine, remi we remind ourselves that sometimes pigs do indeed fly, and they surely do in Mason and Dixon. Dixon is a protege of the mathematician William Emerson, who teaches surveying as literal flight above the landscape, reducing the modernist notion of the aerial god's eye view into pure technique, and claims that before surveyors, quote, learn to fly, they had to learn about maps, for maps are the aid memoir of flight, and map mapping is a journey onward into a country unknown, an act of earth, irrevocable as taking flight, making maps, telling stories, these are all acts of earth, which no one only document, but create the landscape. And the process is translated 90 degrees from the orthogonal space of a map to the rough surface of the wall. 
At least this is with one character, a Jesuit in the novel, a Jesuit operating cartographical revenge against the colonials from a fortified monastery in Quebec, reveals during one of the many fantastical passages in the novel, quote, as a wall projected upon the Earth's surface becomes a right line, so shall we find that we may shape with arrangements of such lines all we may need, be it in a crofter's hut or a great mother city, rules of presidents, routes of approach, lines of sight, flows of power. To make a map is to make a wall, and to cast something on a wall is to tell the story of the land. I'm just gonna leave it at that, so hopefully we can open this up to like some discussions. Thank you. Yeah, because, because uh, I would say definitely in uh, the ticket that exploded, there's a lot of air, there's a lot of air battles. There are a lot of air battles in that book. So, and it's, you know, and it's, you know, spacecraft fighting and stuff. So it's, yeah, I think, I think so. Um, but uh, I think that uh, I do feel that his kind of like cartographical imagination, if you want to call it that, actually, I think it's, it came more of a result from his travels. I mean, he basically was hanging out in Tangier with Paul Bowles and, you know, and Byron Geisen and other people. Um, so the image of, from, from, the, from the book, uh, it's not up anymore, but um, the, uh, sure, I mean, the, um, I can't find it, but, um, no, that's not it. Um, not important, but um, yeah, that's that's a. Uh, I mean, that is. A, I mean, that image. I you know, I would like to spend you know, some time in some kind of archive trying to figure out what exactly that is. The, 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 book the cover of the book, yeah, yeah, but it's you know, it's. Uh, um, but yeah, yeah, and then uh, and the thing is like, uh, Burroughs is not a, you know not only interested in aerial warfare, but like the critics kind of picked up on it as well. And we're actually kind of like extrapolating that to absurd, you know, conclusions from his own, you know, from his own writing, like Mary McCarthy did for the first issue of the New York Review of Books. So, all right. So, well, I'll just turn it off. So. Uh, yeah, I mean, it, because it, seem, it seems like also when you Yeah. The bombing, right, as one who is right. occupying that space up there and therefore, you know, destroying, like, yeah. language, right? Destro destro destroying, like, the, the typical structure of the novel, the typical way in which we string words together. Like, it's, it seems like it's, it's equally about, about the, the, the sort of way it's the, the perhaps primary or inevitable result of being in that position. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, <coughs> that's interesting, and I would put that. I would. I would place that kind of like the kind of conceptual model that you've kind of described against like the business of bombing during the Second War, which is a, which was a kind of bureaucratized vision. Like if you use, for example, the Norden bomb site, the Mark Fifteen, you would in, you would you would use this like you know if you were the bomber during the Pucks of Glass Nose, you would you would input all these coordinates and you would turn on the thing and the plane would actually fly itself and determine when the airspeed was correct and stuff. So it was total control, not in total, it was total control and there was no, no willingness to like uh, undo or, or what, you know, of course it, 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 was, it was not a, it was not a, it was not a perfect, it was not a perfect system, you know, again, you know, you could get shot while doing this, you know, 
but yeah, that's a very that's a very interesting that's a very interesting way to put it. Um, uh, it's interesting because uh, it reminds me it reminds me of so some of something that Sonia brought up uh, the idea of like compressing space and time, you know. Uh, uh, so I think it was Mohinaj, for example, when uh, you know in, in you know in von Materials' architecture, like uh, when he talks about aerial photo photographs, he calls them space compressors, right? And that's an interesting idea because it kind of like conflates the it kind of conflates the kind of like view from below and the view from above into like a single kind of like on, on, onto like a single operation or a single surface. So, but you know, it's an it, that's I mean, your your model I think is more plausible than any kind of like interpretation that I can like, you know, spin around it or whatever. So <laughs> yeah. Uh, you and then Sonia. So. Yeah, I, I actually have a question which I kinda wanna bring Sonia's talk in yeah.
think, I, I think that, uh, uh, just to follow up on what Sonia was saying, uh, a way to distinguish, uh, and this just speaks to the nature of the two professions, it's like, you could say that uh, the people who were engaged in the projects you described were experts in that field, whereas the people who were engaged in photo interpretation were not. They used ancillary expertise in order to, to uh, kind of overlap their, you know, like the archaeologists may be talking to the, uh, maybe talking to the historian and they look at, you know, they'll look at, you know, this indentation on the coast of France or this thing, you know, is that a bunker or is it like, or is it like a barrow from, you know, some other, other time. Um, but a, a, another way that you can start, uh, and also, uh, you know, uh, uh, also, but then again, camouflage also, like you, you can say that it required its kind of own expertise, like Pratt Institute had its own camouflage school during the Second World War, for example. Um, uh, but another way, you know, I just I just thought of this, and you know, I'm, you know, you know, I'm thinking out loud here. You know, forgive me, but this idea, uh, one way that I kind of see the the connections between the what what I what Sonia was like so eloquently putting up, and what I was so desperately trying to like, you know, paint on the wall here. Uh, it's, it's this, uh, the idea of, um, if there's some kind of relationship between the idea of camouflage as a device that breaks up form and actually cut, breaking up the form of a novel, you know, as, you know, whether through the cutting of actual strips of paper or like looking at the mosaic, the aerial mosaic is kind of like this model for writing. You know, that was, that's another thing that I was thinking about as well. Um, but I, I think that uh, I, um, another thing that I that I, I thought about when I was like uh, uh, listening to Sonia was uh, uh, there's a scene in uh, there's a scene in Macbeth where uh, uh, where the the witches have that uh, vision of the Burnham Wood moving like as a, as a, as this formation of troops and it's interesting because like what Sonia is describing is like if we're talking about total war and total mobilization, it's the mobilization of the landscape in service of war, like literally and figuratively, right? It's like you know, you're literally moving plant and you're like enlisting the natural environment, you know, along with the built environment in service of, you know, a, 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 a certain goal, you know. This is That's actually funny because someone would ask you where you get quotes. Well, they should, yeah, so. Uh, Burroughs did not. Burroughs did not serve. Uh, Pynchon was w graduated from college in the fifties, but he um, he basically before he was a novelist wrote uh, technical literature for the Boeing Aerospace Company and basically wrote publication materials about uh, uh, this thing called the Bomark, which is this like one of the first ballistic missiles. Um, and he's like, uh, I mean, his his output is not as as large as you know, some other novelists, but it's, uh, uh, and both, both writers are kind of polymaths, you know, I mean, it's, there's nothing, there's nothing about their, their backgrounds that they're, that, you know, that I would say that, that, that would say that, that they're particularly inclined towards this, like, view towards landscape, except the fact that Pynchon probably knows everything, you <laughs> know, I mean, he's, he's a, I mean, when you, like, when you, when you pick up one of his books, it's actually like a Kindle, like, like, like a, like a like a, uh, a binary version of or so like a like a hard version of a Kindle, and like it has everything in the world kind of encoded in its pages, you know. But yeah, in terms of like you know how you can talk about it, whether you can kind of glean a specific expertise in like the built and natural environments, you know, other than like knowledge of like history, no. I mean, so. I don't know. 
Yeah, yeah I don't know. I, I, you sound like you're more, you sound like you know more about it than I do. Um, the, um, so you're asking if, if uh, you can kind of glean something about indexicality from both Burroughs' writing and from this idea of, of yeah, or maybe Right. Because you've moved beyond like maybe the clear narrative and linear structure of the way that we understand our kind of people right. have agent perception in the world. Um, and then we've moved into these paranoid yeah. systems but, of mediation. But the paranoid, his definition of paranoid is very particular. It's not yeah. it's not like, you know, at the end of Goodfellas where you're seeing black helicopters everywhere. No, no, no. It's a it's, it's a very it's a very nuanced, you know, notion of what paranoia is. So in terms of like seeking orders, I, again, it's like I think it's it's just it's, it just it just kind of like speaks to just like a a a, 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 a difference between just a, like a core difference between like what the landscape architects and architects of Sonia, you know, is, was showing and like the photographic interpreters that I was showing for, you know, for example, when you're when you are uh, when you created the passive air defenses, you know, for Hamburg or you know or whatever, it's uh, there's a certain, there's a certain, um, you know, there are procedures that you have to follow. It's like you have, you know, you have to cover, you have to cover up the lake because if you don't, it's going to be, it, it's going to be the thing that everyone's going to aim at, you know, from the air. So, you, you, you know, you move the bridge, and you know, it's like, and I think with with uh, with uh, uh, with, uh, with the photo interpreters. This kinds of these these kinds of procedures. Um, I mean, of course, there's like there's the actual like daily op. You know, the thing is like you know the people unload the cameras from the aircraft and they put them in the developing room and they you know and then they take them to the they take them to the they take them to uh, to the rooms. What's interesting about the actual process of stereoscopy uh, uh, is that it's not it's not it's not completely foolproof. And the thing is like it's totally dependent on how the person how the person's binocular vision works, right? So one eye may be skewed or something like that. So they have to, they not only have to like overlap the photograph like like this, but sometimes they have to do this and sometimes they have to do a third photograph and stuff. And and then, you know, and then they, they have to, there's the different kind, there are different ranks of people that have to, you know, you know, and then there's the whole thing where, uh, you know, this weird, this weird haha at Pinamunda, you know, this weird thing and this weird cutout in the ground, you know, it's not, you know, so you start, it starts going up, you know, different levels of expertise, but at that, at the, at the very, very base of, of the operation, when you have people who are like trying to figure out what the hell this thing on the photograph is, it's like, there's no, I mean, it's, 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 there's a lot of, you know, there's a lot of guesswork, and it's only through experience where you can say, like, well, this looks like something that we saw earlier that you can start kind of, like, you know, aggregating a kind of, like, order out of it as well, so. Right. I found it really, I found it totally interesting that you, bang, you, you, you began with the notion of Sharawagi, um, which is, um, there's a kind of camouflaging operation involved in resuscitating that term and bringing it to the post-war world, you know. So, and it's like, it's a, uh, you know, it's, it's you know, in, uh, uh, who is it, Hume de Crone Hastings and other people writing for Architectural Review when they were deploying the term, they were like using it as a, as a synonym for a particularly British kind of modernity that was, that was in play. But I think, so I think just to like bring this to the, like bring this to the present and like what's going on in architecture schools at the moment, 
would you be comfortable with the proposition that what you are describing is this kind of like early moment in this genealogy of what we can call landscape urbanism? Because you're talking about a total, a total, you're talking about many of the aspects that we associate with that are deeply embedded in what you were presenting. You know, which, where it's like integration of natural and built features, you know, the, the buildings of landscapes, blah, blah, blah. So, I mean, right? Yeah, you can speak up here. So. so it's more in, you know, it's a, basically an aesthetic idea, an aesthetic concept. Um, and so that contrasts, yeah. right? I, I, you know, that contrasts with the current ideas, whether you want to call them landscape urbanism, eco yeah. you know, ecological urbanism, or whatever is coming next. Um, but the, and, but I mean the, so in that point, you know, and that, I would say, from that point of view, it's something different because yeah. right now what's happening in landscape, in landscape schools, I can only talk about landscape architecture. Sure, sure. So, um, is really the attempt to integrate um, or to reintegrate um, aesthetics and environmental concerns and yeah. environmental functions. Yeah. Um, so, and, and natural, you know, so basically the functioning of natural systems, understanding them better, mm -hmm. um, but basically tying them together with um, a certain aesthetic appeal with, you know, obviously kind of cultural meaning yeah. with, um, at least it, that was, would, would be what I would see as the kind of, yeah. you know, op optimal the I ideal. So, and that. But also, I mean, this emphasis on the material. I mean, one way to distinguish it, I think, is this like this like this this emphasis. Uh, I, as I told you, I'm working with landscape architects in the moment, and like what what. Uh, so, when I was watching your presentation, it was like like I, I, I you know, you are well. First of all, you're giving a history of the of the moment during the Second World. You're giving a a, a, a history of the Second World War view through the lens of landscape architects. Which uh, is interesting to me because it ends with Dan Kiley uh, designing the, the 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 courtroom at Nuremberg for the for for uh, you know, this is yeah. where you translate you know this, this, these like kind of aesthetic constructions and stuff that can be projected on the walls, right? But um, but it's like to me it, the moments that I, that I felt that you were like I, I am I am watching. Uh, landscape architecture work is this kind of an emphasis, like on the material, the material, the thingness right. of the things. Because you know, whenever I whenever I read about whenever I read about camouflage, it's kind of like it's heavily tempted by this like very kind of like modernist kind of like it's about you know like assembly of things so things don't look the way that they used to. But, but you're talking about it as like you actually have to put this here and you have to put this here and it's like it has to be a certain height and you can't can't do this and it can do this, so, which I found really, really, really fascinating. So. I think there's a, ten right, there's a tension somehow yeah. in this explosion that you described yeah. and dealing with that explosion or dealing with um, the breaking up of forms, which yeah. they're deeply concerned with. Right. But then on the, on, the, you know, on the other hand, so it's kind of an basically you know, an abstraction, but then they have to, just because they are designers of the land yeah. and something needs to happen on the land so they have to basically bring it back yeah. onto the ground. So I think kind of there, there seems, you know, there's this tension, this continuous tension a bit between the aerial yeah. view and redirecting attention to the ground and what happens mm -hmm. on the ground and building on the ground. Um, but in, you know, in terms of landscape urbanism, I think that's actually something that really ties more into ideas of the 19th century. Sure. And yeah. And basically, you know, in the second half of the 19th century, when um, designers were beginning to understand better the relationship between, you know, ecology being coined in mm -hmm. 1866, that term, and mm -hmm. basically scientists, but also designers, then on the basis of what scientists were producing, mm -hmm. understanding better how natural systems worked, yeah. and worked and what the relationships between 
living beings, but living beings and also the abiotic right, substances right, right. are. And so I would, um, you know, see basically a lot of origins um, in late 19th, mid, well, mid and late 19th century mm -hmm. development in lands, because, I mean, we're talking, it's such a kind of <laughs> difficult area in some ways, or fuzzy area, because of course landscape architecture as a profession yeah. was also only founded at the end of the 19th century. Right. But if we're talking about anybody concerned or dealing with the design of the land in some capacity, mm -hmm. then um, basically these, what we call today ecological concerns that people at the time were not really meant, you know, talking about ecological con concerns or ecology, or ecosystem, I mean, ecosystem being a term that was only coined in the early 20th century. Mm -hmm. So, um, so I think kind of what we're seeing today is very much based upon what was happening in the late 19th century, mm -hmm. and you can see um, on the well, yes, late 19th century, and then there, con there are even concepts in Europe that are that you know that call themselves or that that. that um, Geographers were using it in the early 20th century, uh, the city landscape. Mm -hmm. So they were already talking about the city landscape. So it's, an, it's a concept, or really the idea of having or using a natural system as the generator of urban form, mm -hmm. which is part of what um, landscape urbanism is proposing, is an idea that is much older, that has been around for a long time. Yeah. So Something that's also really interesting about the material that you presented, um, uh, I feel like, so in this like, you know, in this like conflagration that's otherwise known as the Second World War, which you can like begin even as early as the Spanish Civil War and then end, you know, uh, even a little bit after the Second World War, it's like, it's, you know, in many ways, uh, there's this, uh, when you're showing these like, uh, these schemes, it's like this like, it's this will to control as much as possible in the face of absolute chaos. You know, I mean, and it's and it's done through the, and it's done through these like, it's 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 done through this like incredible oscillation of means from very humble things from like you know you know uh, uh, you know movement of, of, of bushes to like painting you know stripes on the on the ground to the illusion of the physical dislocation of major urban areas, you know, I mean, it's, 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 a very, it's a very, I mean, it's a very, uh, uh, it's a very interesting thing to me. Also, um, and I just thought about this, but, you know, like, those artists, you know, why is it that those artists that we associate with, like, land art, who, you know, viewed it from the air, you know, it's interesting, like, they all died in airplane crash. Right, yeah, it's kind of a tragedy. Yeah, yeah so <laughs> it's like, you know, you get, like, I mean, you mean like in, cur in current landscape architectural practice? Yeah. Um, I mean, you know, what, what, is, what is very, uh, that one, one thing that's actually interesting is that, um, so landscape ecologists, or landscape, again, landscape ecology, 
um, is a term, again, you know, one of these new terms that was coined um, just very shortly before the Second World War. Um, and then the landscape ecologists used aerial photography, or mm -hmm. the, the person who actually coined landscape ecology, that, that term, the German geographer Karl Paul, he, um, he claimed all throughout his career, and he had a very successful, so after actually wanting the German, he, he was extremely keen on the Nazis, or uh, on the Nazis actually using his research, because of course he wanted the research mm -hmm. money. Um, so a after the Second World War, he had actually a very successful career in, in German academia, and claimed all throughout his career that um, landscape ecology was actually nothing more than aerial photography. Mm. And so, and you can see that, you know, if, if you um, even look, you know, look at my, um, uh, colleague Richard Foreman, uh, who, if, if you read any of his books on landscape ecology, you'll find that uh, aerial photography actually plays a huge role, in, or has played a huge role in his research as well. So the recognition of patterns, and in the case of landscape ecologists in particular, um, vegetation patterns, so that's how they began uh, their careers usually as, as botanists. Um, and you know, the use of landscape ecology, I think, in today's uh, landscape architecture is really, um, plays a huge role, is, is prevalent. So there's, there's kind of one connection, actually, to um, pre-war time use of aerial photography that was then instrumentalized by the military in various capacities, because um, the recognition of different ecotones, as the mm -hmm. ecologists like, like, like to say, um, was extremely important for the military because they were drawing up their maps and identifying, you know, where could the heavy machinery go, could it go, so the identification, obviously, of different uh, marshland biotopes, for example, or uh, wetlands, um, et cetera, was, um, yeah, was, was basically, was in part at least based upon the knowledge um, that landscape ecologists came up with. And in terms of like mobile landscapes, so you know, the, the military actually pr producing mobile landscapes in various capacities, also for airfields. I mean, they literally, the Germans had um, hedges on rollers and you know, entire villages on rollers kind of with fake smoke coming out of chimneys of the houses, and then they rolled it back if, if their own aircraft had to land. Um, so, uh, I think, you know, th there's a new, one of my colleagues is actually working on a, I mean, this is different, but it's, it's about mobility, and it's about transport, and it's about um, the global transportation of materials that we use in, in landscape. So Jane Hutton, one of my colleagues, is is working on, you know, basically you could say a material culture of um, landscape yeah. elements. Well, this idea of like using using this like um, assuming ass just assuming for the minute for this moment that like uh, aerial photography is a kind of abstraction, a kind of abstraction, right? Aerial views, but using that same model as a as a way to start. Uh, planning the surface of the earth. I mean, it's very reminiscent of like people like Von Thunen or Walter Christaller, who basically, you know, use this like hyper-rational understanding of the topography of the world below as, as a way to understand qualitative relationship between points, you know, uh, you know in a region. Um, and another thing, so when you were talking about like, you know, about uh, like landscape ecology, just aerial photography, this, this uh, it just reminds me of this kind of like, you know, immediately after the post-war world about how um, advances in the social sciences were always uh, always tacking on to the importance of aerial photography. So people like Paul Henri Chambartolo or Marcel Mauss, you know, who basically who relied extensively on aerial photography to understand the social construction, the, 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 the uh, oh yeah, I was here, the, the patterns of civilization in the world below, right? 
So for them, aerial photography, as, as landscape ecology was aerial photography, for them, aerial photography was sociology, right? It was a kind of sociology. So, interesting. Yeah, right, yeah. 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 So. Okay, well, I want to see your testimony. Okay. Um, <laughs>